A guten Erev Shabbos. What's the part of a book that you are least likely to read? Probably the introduction. Why are they there? What's the purpose? I already picked up the book to read it, so show me what you got. Don't spend my time telling me why you wrote it or what went into writing it. Well, you get the picture. Introductions usually don't have all that much pizzazz, so they frequently get skipped over. Read the book, skip the introduction. Just this once, this one time, let me suggest the opposite. I have a book for you to read, to read the introduction with great care, and then don't read the rest of the book. Okay, you're not going to get rid of the whole thing. You're not going to read it, you're going to daven it. The Koran Rabbi Sachs, Rosh Hashanah Machzer, for which I get no royalties, is a well-organized, not too heavy, beautifully printed book. And it is, of course, our preferred machzer of choice here at KST that we announce the pages from. And it's worth it just for the introduction. The introduction to this machzer by Lord Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs is a marvelous piece of Jewish thought and Rosh Hashanah theology. And since we have a full week to go before Rosh Hashanah is upon us, let me suggest that you take your machzer off the shelf now and in the coming days, spend a little time reading and even rereading the introduction carefully and attentively. You'll find it time well invested, please be assured. Some of us have been looking at this introduction on Friday mornings at our breakfast learning over the past couple of weeks, <coughs> excuse me, but we've not got to this part that I want to look at today. So do take a look at it, and maybe as you're reviewing the prayers and reminding yourself of your favorite tunes this week, also take a look at the introduction, particularly the last few pages, <coughs> which are subtitled, What Rosh Hashanah Says to Us. Rabbi Sachs writes that the genius of Judaism was to take eternal truths and translate them into time. In other words, these points of faith, these illuminating insights from Torah are not simply things to meditate on or reflect upon. Rather, our tradition places them in a template, on a schedule of familiar patterns. Six days of work and then a seventh day of rest makes us reflect on the theological point of God's creating the whole world. Sitting down to recline and sing and drink wine at the Seder makes us think of freedom and redemption in the springtime, and so on. The spirit and the mood of the high holy days is invoked by that very name. And in Hebrew, the yamim noraim, the days of awe. Rosh Hashanah, Rabbi Sachs writes, tells us that time is a limited and precious commodity. We should have our life's ambition and hopes and dreams, and we find that life is too short to accomplish or achieve everything that we set out to do. So we have to prioritize. A few years ago, just before he passed away, Shimon Peres's book, No Room for Small Dreams, was published in English. And notably, in the introduction of all places, Perez writes, quote, make a pile of, I'm not quoting directly, I'm quoting from memory. Make a pile of things you've accomplished in life, and then make a second pile of things you still hope to accomplish. If the second stack is larger than the first, you are still young. That's a bit of perspective we can all use and appreciate. The next point Sachs underscores from Rosh Hashanah's message to us is that every moment, every breath, is a gift from God. If we appreciate the preciousness of every moment and hold up its potential, we find the inspiration and motivation truly to be all that we can be. Unfortunately, sometimes it takes loss, particularly of those close and dear to us, to come to appreciate the depth of this. But the focus and intensity of this 48 hours of Rosh Hashanah helps us reach that awareness amidst a carefully focused joy rather than sadness. Third point, he says, is freedom. We are truly free, which means both accountability and responsibility and also the certainty that we're not in the grip of sin or determinism, and we can write the story that stretches out ahead of us in life. Rosh Hashanah is a new chapter, a new perspective, a new 
granting of strength to do this. Teshuva, the perspective of securing the future by redeeming the past, is an important element of this. Fourth point, that life is meaningful. We're not here by some cosmic accident. Our lives are not random occurrences. God brought us into being for a purpose, knowing our capabilities and our limitations, and nevertheless giving us ample resources to make something significant and fulfilling out of the time that we have on this earth. That being said, Rabbi Sachs emphasizes, it does not mean that life is easy or is guaranteed to be easy or should be easy. In fact, it's often in the very striving that we find the deepest meaning and satisfaction. We have a long national memory and it involves a lot of dark times. The world that we find is not the world as it ought to be, but we never lose hope and we know we are never alone. Wherever we go, God's divine presence accompanies us. Although life is sometimes hard, it can also be sweet, as the honey on the challah and the apples. We do not need to be rich to share. We do not need power to be strong, he writes. We give, we seek, we pray, we praise, we work, and we look forward to change for the better. Sometimes we are pleasantly surprised, but in the work itself lies the real reward. He quotes Rabbi Soloveitchik to say that our life is the greatest artwork we will ever make. Our drive to be original, to be innovative, and to use our talents and our abilities to renew ourselves is the work of life itself. Also, we are here because of those who came before us. We focus specifically on parents, at Yizkor, on Yom Kippur. But on Rosh Hashanah, we see our place in the order of things. And we are, each of us, as Rabbi Sachs puts it, a letter in God's book of life. Single letters have no meaning when they stand alone. We must be joined to others in order to have meaning. As he writes so movingly, to be a Jew is to be part of the strangest, oldest, most unexpected and counterintuitive story there has ever been. The story of a tiny people, never large and often homeless, who nevertheless outlived the greatest empires the world has ever known. We remember on Rosh Hashanah those who came before us, Abraham and Isaac, Sarah and Hagar and Yishmael, and we affirm our part in the ongoing story. In remembering all this, and remembrance is one of the three key themes of Musaf, of the day of Rosh Hashanah, we're asked to do great things by Yiddishkeit, by Torah, by God. And in answering this call, it makes us great. We answer to high standards. The world is watching. Much is expected. And we are meant to be, called to be, a light unto the nations, the shining example the treasured nation, Am Segula, as we read last week. And finally, that the sound of the shofar capturing in sound where words fail, crying, wailing, sobbing, is in his words all the pathos of the divine human encounter as God asks us to take his gift, life itself, and make of it something holy, by so acting as to honor God and his image on earth, humankind. In all this, Rosh Hashanah is truly, as its name says, the head of the year. Our approach, our centering ourselves in all these points of reference that Rabbi Sachs reminds us of, puts us in the ideal place to begin a new year on our absolute best and most solid and purposeful footing. In fact, our double Parsha that we read this week starts with that very idea. You are all standing, all of you, on this day. The day that Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking about here is the day of his life's conclusion and almost the day of our entering into the land of Israel. And since we invariably read this portion of Atem Nitzavim, 
just before Rosh Hashanah. We can appreciate that Moshe includes us, all of us, the heads of your tribes, the, your elders and your officers, the children, women, the ger, in the midst of your camp, the hewer of your wood and the drawer of your water. The Orachayim HaKadosh, Reb Chaim Ibn Attar, asks, why didn't Moshe just say, all of you? Why categorize us and separate us into different classifications? He answers his own question by saying that this Parsha is all about mutual responsibility. Aravus, the, nation, the notion that we're all in this together. There's an overt allusion to this in the dots you see printed over the letters in the last verse of chapter 29, but that's for another time. The understanding the Orachayim wants us to take with us is that we take responsibility for one another, not just as a yoke of obligation, but as our life and the meaning of our days. This is the essence of the season, when we all stand together as one, asking, as we always do, God's blessing. Barchenu avinu kulanu ke'echad. Bless us, our Father, all of us, as one. We are most worthy of God's blessings when we behave as if we are one people, caring about and responsible for one another. In no place that I've found does it say we all have to agree with one another. But we all have to find a way to manage together. This judging one another favorably, taking responsibility for each other. May this change of heart, this turn of attitude, be the beginning of a new year of peace and success and health and all good things for us amongst Kalal Yisrael and especially in Israel itself. As we always say, the eternal and undivided capital of Israel. If the capital is undivided, how much more so the people of Israel should be undivided. Kenya Hiratzon, may it be God's will, and may we all merit to make God's will and plan for peace here on earth that much more of a reality. Shabbat Shalom, Shana Tova Umetuka. A happy, healthy, and sweet new year.